Our next performer um, is absolutely, has more talent in her little pinky than anybody I know. All right. It's, she's a mezzo-soprano. On top of that, she's a phenomenal violinist. Um, she also, she's performed everywhere in the northern, you know, U.S. continent, e Europe, yeah. everywhere on earth. She sits on the board of the LGBT um, Academy of Music. Recording Arts. Yes. The Academy of Recording Arts. But let's talk Lara. About it. Yeah, Lara. That's the organization that gives the Out Music Awards. That's yes, cool. Yes. Which Good. is phenomenal. Right? Yeah. And the un uh, uh, most, I don't, well, we have to ask her. It's probably one of the, it was very impressive to me. What? She was the first African American transgender violinist and vocalist to perform, to sing for a sitting U.S. president. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Tona, Tona Brown. Tona Brown! Come, come, come talk to us. You can sit right between us. Okay. We'll bring the, the lady, I'll bring the lady's chair up, come on. And you have a mic too. You, that, you, they were right. you don't need that mic, do you? No. I just wanted to make sure that we got it all down, you know what I'm saying? Oh. Because this is Thank you this all is friends. groundbreaking. I this love it. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> Just look at Franz. You I'll match. tap when I need you. Okay. But Thank look, you. they match. I love it. They do. I love it. <laughs> See, we worked on all this out. I'm a little loud for the mic too. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry about it. JP's fabulous. Okay. It's gonna yeah. Just do what you're gonna do. He'll do with you with you. Okay. So I have a question. Sure. When did you discover that you had all this talent? Um, well, I started playing the violin first and mm -hmm. um, started taking violin lessons um, when I was about 14. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been playing ever since I was 10. And I didn't start singing until college. 
And in college, I had so many friends who were vocal majors. And I used to accompany them for various productions and on violin with my ensemble and in the school ensembles. And I would play around with them as far as just joking around and pretending to sing and joking them because I thought that singers were arrogant and, and kind of ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, foot in my mouth, you know? <laughs> but in, and it's so interesting now because more people hire me to sing than play violin. So, you that's know. fabulous, though. Now, where did you go to college? I went to Shenandoah University mm. in conservatory music. Um, I went to the Governor's School for the Arts, um, and I've done programs at Eastman and Juilliard. I love music, and I think that it has a lot of healing um, properties, and, you know, I can't imagine doing anything else. That, you know what? It, it, it's so wonderful that you're able to do something that you're passionate about. Yes. Um, speaking of Oprah's life lessons, did you hear yes. that one? Yes. She's I like, love if you, Oprah. yeah. I, so I know you guys are gonna hate me, but I love Oprah. <laughs> I, don't worry, I'm with you. That's sister. one of my exactly. Idols. I'm with you, sister. Wait. <laughs> um, so, so when you started singing, was it was it before you transitioned? Yes, it was, and it was actually very difficult um, to have such a rare instrument. You can imagine, I went through a lot. And also, a lot of the teachers didn't know what to do with me. So they tried to have me sing tenor, and I would crack horribly because my voice naturally sits extremely high, alto-y, even mm -hmm. in my chest voice. And so if it wasn't high, singing high Cs, Ds, and Fs, you know, <laughs> now, it right. was ridiculous. Uh -huh. So um, my teacher was like, well, what are you going to sing? Like, there's no roles for you. And, and I'm like, well, I have another octave or so. So were you considered a countertenor, a true? Yeah, I, well, first they called me a tenorino. I was like, okay. A what? You know what yeah. that is. <laughs> Wait, I've never heard of that. What is a tenorino? It was, it was something like a extremely high tenor, but it, their voices are usually very light mm -hmm. and extremely high, but my voice was cracking all the time and um, it got very stressful. And one day I started crying um, to one of my best friends who's another dramatic mezzo. And I told her, I said, I just, I don't know what's happening. Like, I love to sing. I'm learning about this and I'm singing with you all, but I'm cracking all the time. And she said, well, what is the matter? And I broke down in the practice room. And um, she said, well, let me hear what you're talking about. And so, you know, I started lifting the soft palate and I just started singing in what I would have considered at t that time more of a falsetto-y voice. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't what it's developed to now. It was very bright and um, a little offensive. <laughs> um, and, and it just developed with time. And it was because of her saying, you need to, to go and sing for a specialist. And I went to go sing for a specialist and the specialist said, if you want to continue sing if you want to continue singing, you cannot do it as a tenor. You're going to ruin your voice. And, um, and, it, and it's just an, a testament to me on how, who you are inside sometimes people can't see. And then of course I end up transitioning right after college, so. Wow. So do you think, you know, the, the, the I, I can't say the journey with your voice was in parallel with your journey? Absolutely, transition? absolutely. Yeah? Um, it was the one defining thing that even I couldn't say, it was one of those moments where you say, okay, you know how you feel. Um, everyone sees it around you, but I can't deny my voice. Mm -hmm. And for years I was so scared to sing. I always sung alto and gospel choir. I did a lot of gospel at that time, believe it or not. And um, I, I couldn't deny what was happening. You know, I was trying to force a voice that wasn't there. Right, 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 right. And, and, and it's the same parallel with you as a transgender individual. At some point you have that feeling like, okay, you know, you know. And, he, and those that are closest to you know. And your parents usually know. Um, it was interesting actually when, when, when I was doing research on you and um, 
I, I guess it was right around the time where you were coming to terms with you being transgender and you were growing your hair. Yeah. And it was very interesting the way that I your mom article, reacted. I know the article I think you're talking about. I thought that was so silly, the way the woman brought that out. I understood, but it's one of the issues I have with the media, um, mm -hmm. not really understanding. I mean, there's a quote in that article where you're like, oh, she likes to wear her hair curly and sometimes straight and with braids. Like, who talks like that? <laughs> I don't know what that is, because I didn't read that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> that wasn't the article. Jesus. That might be another one. I'm no, but it was actually the way that your mother reacted, oh. which was, I thought, was amazing. Yeah, my mother is, and even though she's passed, I still feel that she gave me such a great foundation because she didn't judge anyone. In fact, she talked very affectionately about the children. That's what she called um, LGBT people. You the know, she, she called them the children. And she said, you know, the children are very blessed. And I know that the world does understand. You have to understand I'm from Southern Virginia. Um, the Bible Belt. She we was say a youth. No more, right? Okay, she was a she was a youth evangelist. Um, my aunt is a minister. It goes down the line, and so it was revolutionary for her to have just that sort of in tuneness, if that's a word, insight. You yeah, know, insight into her child, and she used to braid my hair, and we used to talk, and she tried to teach me that people are going to say certain things and do certain things, but no matter what, I love you. And she tried to safeguard me, don't put your hand on your hip in here. Oh, yeah. You know, she really tried because she started to see it, but she felt that she wanted me to have a really good self-esteem. She did an excellent job because- Yeah, you know, absolutely, I, no doubt about it. I love, I, I love being who I am authentically. Um, as Oprah speaks about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I can't imagine taking the road any other way. So that's great. So, so also the other thing, um, you do a lot of work with, with uh, the out music and the, the, the LGBT. What when is said, it? It's called Lara. Uh -huh. So it's what? <laughs> yes. LGBT, LGBT Recording Academy, Academy, Academy of Recording, recording Artists. Artists. Yes. Um, it's an honor to be on the board. I'm actually on the board of advisors. And um, when they contacted me and said, look, we've been reading all this stuff. Um, I had to perform for the Department of Veteran Affairs. I love the veterans. And um, every year they asked me to come and perform and sing the national anthem and speak at, in DC. And um, sh they heard about me through different things and I was just blown by the mission statement. And I'm like, this is me, like this, I need to know more about this organization, how long has it been around? And to find out it had been around for 20 years or 20 years plus. And yeah, the two guys that started it, started it in their living room basically as a place to give some recognition to their hardworking singing friends that yeah. were not, who are just as good and capable and talented as people that were getting Grammy Award nominations, exactly. but who were being excluded because of who they gender are. and sexuality and all right. that. Yeah. And, and I, what I love too is that we're trying our best to give an equivalent platform for all people. And the board in particular was so embraced, they embraced me so well that, you know, it was an emotional and a spiritual experience. Um, just talking to them and seeing, you know, especially um, Deidre Meredith, um, who is the with the executive director, chairperson. chairperson. Um, we had so many long conversations about why this was important. And she will tell you, and anyone who knows me, I am not the type of person, probably because of my mother, my great aunts, you know, I was raised by a whole family of very powerful um, women of color. And I don't take no for an answer. I'm not one of those people. And for someone to come to me and a group to come and say, we've noticed what you've done. We're proud of what you've done. Could you please come and advise us and, and let's see how we can make an equivalent platform for all? I was totally for it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's, it's interesting, you know, being raised by strong black women and, you know, having, you know, talking about equivalent platforms and stuff. 
how has the African American community accepted you, reacted to you? Um, the African American community has accepted me for who I am. I don't necessarily know that most of them understand it. Does that make any sense? I mean, it's yeah, just like yeah, anyone yeah. in this room, if you haven't walked this walk, you might not understand, but you might be a little bit more open or empathetic or what have you. Um, I haven't had any problems with them, per se. You well, know, I, like personally, like right. someone just come in and attacking me for being who I am or being out or anything like that. I haven't had it. But I have had jobs that once I, I came out internationally where I sat down with different ministers where I used to work at their churches. And it wasn't necessarily a black church. It was mm -hmm. actually a very wealthy church in Norfolk, Virginia that said, you know, we want to know why did you say anything? That was the only problem they had. I used to work with the youth. Um, so uh, it was OK if you transitioned as long as you don't tell anybody that you transitioned? Yes. So just appear. That, that was OK. Just, just appear someday as a woman and Right, that, that was fine with history. them, because that's all they knew me as anyway, okay. and that's who I am. And it was OK for me to work with the youth. I used to work with um, young ladies who were young ladies who were underprivileged, um, who, who, who would come into our choir. Um, Hold on just a sec. Hold on. No, that's fine. All right. We've got cops outside. We always like a man in uniform. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I was saying, at that particular church, I used to work with the youth, and we built a choir for these young ladies who had children, um, who lived in the projects, and who wanted to think about something more than just where they were. And I used to give voice lessons. Um, I love to teach. I still love to teach um, when I can. And um, I was very sad, not for me, because I made the choice to you know, let the world know about myself intimately, but those young ladies don't have that anymore. And I think that's, that's why I made the right decision. It, it, it's interesting, but the reason. I just, oh, there, there I go. <laughs> no, the reason why I asked that is because, of, especially, well, you know, the African American community can be kind of rough. And, you know, we have a lot of um, gay LGBT folks that go through a lot when yes. they come from. An African American because they're so very much based. The community is based around very deep religious roots. I agree. Um, it just wasn't my personal experience. Which is that fabulous. I, I think it's great that I got a lot of backlash from the community, mm -hmm. and possibly because not to ex not to say that this is the only answer. The type of work that I did, even if they had a some kind of issue with who I was. I was doing I was doing community service work, and right. I still do around the country. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work, um, and so it just never was an issue. And I think that in my life, since I don't make it a huge issue, the media does. Right. You know. Right. Right. Um, I think that most people who get a chance to get to know me just see me as me. Mm -hmm. You know, as exactly. a person, as a as a black woman. You know. And a beautiful one, by the way. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Do we have any questions out in the audience? Do you mind answering some questions for us? Sure, sure. Questions? Come We're on, out folks. Once, Are you scared? Twice. <laughs> I'm not going to bite oh. you. <laughs> Don't you want to know what it was like to sing for the president? And a very nice looking president, too. Oh, yes. <laughs> You should see the picture I have. I was holding him for dear life. Do you have the picture? I'd be holding on to him too. The question I would have is as you were transitioning uh, mm -hmm. with all the hormones, from what I know, were you concerned about it, the hormone and the impact on your voice? Yes. Um, I have a friend who has done a lot of work with the transgender voice in England. His name is Alice Constances. And we used to have this conversation all the time. And because he'd done a lot of work, he was actually female to male, obviously, as a transgender individual. And 
I read a lot and I did a lot of research first. And um, I knew that it wasn't gonna harmfully affect my voice. If anything, it makes it a little easier to stay in that upper register when you don't have testosterone pulling it down. Right, so any other questions out in the audience? Would you like to hear her sing again? Yeah. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you do you have something for us for you? To, I don't um, know. Not, not with the uh, pianist. Right. Uh, do you want to do something a cappella? I could. Oh. What would you like to hear? <laughs> <laughs> Take us back know? to your roots. There you go. I will do that. I there will you go. do that. Um, I will just sing a little bit of a Negro spiritual for your Beautiful. for your audience. If they don't mind. Tony Brown. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Tona Brown. Yeah. 